Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about sedimentology and stratigraphy. And this is our fourth lesson over said strat so far. And in today's lesson, we'll be going over the fabric or texture and framework of sediment, specifically detrital types of sediment like gravel, sand, clays and shales, and the fossil fragments in fossiliferous limestones. And in this whole second half of the video, we'll be focusing mostly on packing, porosity, and permeability, and how these different fabrics affect these properties of sediment. So we know from our previous said strap videos that there are two major classes of sedimentary rocks, and these include detrital and chemical. Detrital rocks are those that form from clastic or detrital sediment that falls down into a basin and accumulates and then gets buried, compacted, cemented together, and lithified. But chemical rocks refer to those that precipitate from solution. So things like rock salt or calcite in some cases, most of the time as cements. But as we'll see later, things like calcareous limestones don't have to be chemical. They can also be detrital if they're formed by detrital fossil fragments, for example, which may have been chemical components at one point, but now are being accumulated and compacted and lithified together as a detrital rock rather than a chemical one. So in today's video, we'll be focusing on those detrital types of sediment, including fossil fragments and sand grains, gravel grains, and shale and clays. And we'll be talking about those in terms of their fabric, which is a property of sedimentary rocks, as well as sediment itself, that often gives us information about the transport process of their deposition, as well as the flow direction of the current that deposited those grains. And so we'll be talking about these types of fabrics today, but if you want to know more about the actual transport processes and flow directions and just determining past depositional environments, you can check out my depositional environment playlist or depositional systems playlist. I'll link it up here in the top right corner for you. But regarding today's topic, fabric refers to the spatial arrangement and orientation orientation of fabric elements in a rock or whatever we're referring to. And fabric elements are the components, in the case of rocks, the grains that make up the rocks. So let's go ahead and get into the two major types of fabric. And these include deformation and opposition fabrics. Deformation fabrics are those that form when a rock is being deformed under high pressure. And this is typically more applicable to metamorphic rocks than it is to sedimentary rocks. However, as we'll see later in the video, there is kind of a fuzzy line between metamorphism and diagenesis in some cases, which we'll get more into later. But basically, the major types of fabric we'll be talking about today are opposition fabrics or primary fabrics which are more applicable to sedimentary rocks. And these form by orienting grains by gravitational or magnetic forces and or by fluid flow. Now, over here to the right, we see some figures. We've got this beautiful schist thin section over here with these beautiful mica grains that are very, very foliated and well aligned with each other. And that is a fabric that occurs due to high pressure during metamorphism. If you want to know more about foliation and schists and how they form and the textures and fabrics that they cause, then you could check out my metamorphic petrology playlist. I'll link it up here if you want to check it out. But down in these bottom two figures here, we can see other ways that grains can be oriented. The one on the very right corner shows a current, a fluid of some sort, pushing those pebbles over, orienting them in a certain direction. And we'll talk more about that and imbrication in the next slide. But the other figure I want you to see here is this spreading ridge or mid-ocean ridge where you've got magma coming out and being oriented or the minerals, the components within it being oriented differently depending on whether during its extrusion out of that spreading ridge, the magnetic pole of Earth is reversed or normal. And Earth's magnetic pole has reversed many times over Earth's history, which we can map using the banding that we observe around mid-ocean ridges. And then the last type of fabric I want to mention before we get into the specific example of fabrics in gravels, sands, shales, and limestones is growth fabrics. Growth fabrics are orientations of grains that result from the growth of crystals. And so this is more applicable to 
chemical precipitation. So that last slide, we talked about the difference between chemical and clastic or chemical and detrital. Well, this would apply to the chemical one. And we'll be talking about chemical fabrics in the next video. So I just wanted to mention here that growth fabrics and the orientations of greens because of crystal growth is another type of fabric that we won't talk about here, but it's present in, for example, geodes as shown in this picture here. But this geode and this magma that's coming out of the spreading center and this metamorphic schist over here, those are all not detrital sediments. So we'll be focusing on this bottom right figure, the fluid flow affecting grain orientation model in this video. And what a better place to start than gravel, because gravel is where we most often see, with our own eyes at least, imbrication. And imbrication is the preferred orientation of flat pebbles due to the flow of a current. And imbrication is a good indication of flow direction because it always happens to where the pebbles are tilted in the direction of the fluid flow. So in the example or the image at the top right, the fluid flow is to the left of the screen. And in the bottom right figure, the fluid flow is obviously there's a current with an arrow here is to the right of the screen. And we can see that based on how the pebbles are tilting. And this type of fabric is termed anisotropic because the pebbles, the fabric elements, have a preferred orientation due to the flow of the current. But when they have no preferred orientation, such as that bottom example in the figure to the right, they are called isotropic rather than anisotropic. And there's a couple different little nuanced details we could also gain from looking at gravels in the rock record that are imbricated or do show indication of flow direction. And these include, for example, if it was moving along a frictional substrate or undergoing the type of transport that's called traction, the pebbles tend to transverse the flow direction. Whereas if immersed in the transport media or suspended, they tend to be parallel to the flow direction. But flow velocity can also heavily affect this. For example, if the flow is termed torrential flow, then they're parallel rather than transversing the flow direction. And these are all little nuanced details we can use to tell flow direction. But in general, regards to gravels, imbrication is the best thing you can look for to get the general direction of flow rather than a very specific one. So yes, pebbles and gravel grains are very easy to see when they're imbricated because they're big. Whereas sand grains, for example, might be doing this, but we wouldn't be able to see it with our eyes because they're so small. We would need a hand lens at least or a thin section and look through a microscope. But when we do have a microscope, it turns out that, yeah, sand grains also show current flow direction when they're not super spherical. So when they do have an elongated axis, they do tend to align themselves parallel to current flow as shown in this image here. And this can be seen in fluvial aeolian and even beach sands. However, it would be more difficult to tell the unidirectional flow direction. You would more be able just to say it's along this axis, basically, but you don't know, you know which direction it's going. And in some cases, like beach sands, it might be a bi-directional flow, you know, in and out. But in fluvial circumstances, when you're looking at sandstones, the grain orientation is not going to be the most helpful thing. For fluvial sandstones, what you're going to really actually want to see are sedimentary structures. And although these are incredible incredibly helpful, more so than grain orientation and sandstones, for determining depositional environment and transport processes and flow direction and all of that. We aren't going to be talking about them today because today's video is all about fabrics and we'll be talking about these sedimentary structures in a whole separate video all on their own because sedimentary structures are really important. But one more thing I want to mention before we move on from sands and we'll come back to later, is that sand fabrics are closely related to and therefore heavily affect permeability. And porosity and permeability are a couple of the concepts we'll be going over in the second half of this video. So stick around because those are really, really important. The next type of fabric we'll be talking about are clays and shales. So clays and shales are obviously very, very tiny. If you haven't seen my grain size video in this set strap playlist, I'll link it up here for you to check out. But in general, for the fabric of clays, 
Clay minerals are so platy that they tend to become parallel to bedding due to compaction during burial. Because yes, they may be randomly oriented during deposition, but the compaction very easily aligns them parallel to bedding because they are so platy. We can see this in these thin sections of shales to the right. And this is actually why shales have low porosity, anisotropic fabric or oriented fabrics and have high high facility. So they are easily basically like paper. And if you've ever gone to an outcrop full of shale and tried to like, you know, pick some rocks out of it, sometimes they just kind of fall apart in your hands, like we can see on the right here. And, you know, if you try and crawl up a mountainside full of shale, you're going to have a hard time getting up because you're just going to continue to break the shale and fall back down. I've done that. That's how I know. <laughs> but I do want to put a disclaimer on this low porosity thing, because later when we talk about porosity, you'll see that clays actually tend to have high porosity when they're sediments. It isn't until they become compacted and lithified that that porosity significantly lowers. So we'll talk about sedimentation, lithification, and how that affects porosity as well. And when clay grains are found randomly oriented in clay stones, that means that those grains grew after deposition because we know that they are so platy and because of this if they grew before deposition they would have been aligned during deposition and compaction lastly fabric of fossiliferous limestones or limestones and dolostones basically we know that limestones like i mentioned earlier are many times fully chemical but sometimes they can also be partially chemical and partially clastic or detrital in the case of fossiliferous limestones that's what they tend to be is partially clastic or detrital and partially chemical. The detrital part of them is the fossiliferous part. The fossil fragments that help to make up their framework are detrital grains, whereas the cement that holds it all together is chemical. But because they do have these detrital fragments, they can have detrital fabrics because these fossil fragments can preferentially orient themselves in certain directions during deposition. For example, shell fragments, when moved by a current, tend to deposit themselves convex side up, whereas when moved by turbidity currents, which is something I talk about in a whole separate video about submarine fans, I'll link it up here to the right if you want to check it out, these turbidity currents tend to cause these shells to lie concave side up. So there are a couple different ways that we can determine types of deposition based on just the orientation of fossil fragments in a fossiliferous limestone. But finally, getting to packing, porosity, and permeability. First, let's discuss packing, because packing kind of helps to determine porosity and permeability. So packing is the measure of closeness or density of grains or fabric elements, and examining the packing of sedimentary rocks helps us understand the depositional as well as the post-depositional history of those rocks. So what controls packing. Well, uniformity of grain size or sorting, as well as the sphericity of the grains, how spherical or non-spherical they are, heavily affects the packing of sediments. Here in this figure down to the bottom right, we see two types of packing. And these two types, assuming equal sized spherical grains, are the closest packing arrangement or rhombohedral packing and the loosest or cubic packing. And we can see in these two different types of packing, the porosity is changed dramatically depending on how the sediment's packed. If it's packed rhombohedrally, the porosity is around 26% aka there's less pore space than in the cubic packing where the porosity is 48%. But it's important to remember that porosity does not equal permeability. So let's talk a little bit about porosity and why it's different than permeability. Porosity, like I just showed, is the total void space. That's why larger voids equals more porosity. But permeability is the property of a rock that allows the passage of fluids through that rock. And for fluids to flow through a rock, those pore spaces must be interconnected. As we saw on the previous slide, these pores are not actually interconnected. So an increase in porosity might not mean an increase in permeability. Whereas in this figure, we can see that many of the pores become interconnected in the case on the right, which is why it's termed permeable 
rather than just porous, whereas the center part is porous, but not permeable because those pores are not interconnected. And of course, the example to the far left is not porous or permeable because it doesn't have interconnected pores and it doesn't have pores altogether. This left example is typical of chemical rocks. They tend to have negligible porosity and therefore negligible permeability because they have grain contacts that are right next to each other. They don't tend to have tangential contacts like seen in clastic sediments. And we'll talk about why those grain contacts are like that and how these crystals grow and everything in the next video over chemical fragments. But in today's video, we are focusing on clastic sediments, which do tend to have those tangential contacts. And because of that, they have moderate to high porosity. But what controls this porosity other than just the fact that they have these point contacts? Well, grain size actually has very little effect on porosity. As we can see over here, the size of the grains in these two images of this sand and clay isn't actually affecting the porosity much. In fact, this clay sediment actually has pretty high porosity. And that's because its grains aren't very spherical. They're really elongated and platy. And so any plate grains that have contacts are going to form these like big triangles of pore space. And so they're going to be very porous. It isn't until they're actually buried and compacted upon deposition that they become much less porous because those grains are obviously compacted together, closing up those big triangle pore spaces. So we'll talk about that huge difference in porosity upon deposition in a second. But the things that actually do affect porosity are uniformity of grain size. So sorting, as we can see here, if it's just all equal grain sizes, they tend to be loosely packed and have these big pore spaces but if there's little grain sizes among bigger grain sizes, the littler ones fill the bigger pore spaces and so on and just less pore space overall. And grain shape also affects porosity. The sphericity, if it's more spherical, typically means lower porosity and vice versa. Like we saw the really platy grains will go and form really big pores because their contacts make these big spaces, whereas spherical grains have less big pores. But like I said, deposition and the packing of the grains after they've been compacted drastically affects porosity. For example, sand sediment can typically have porosities around 36% among deposition that decreases to an average of around 15 to 20% after deposition and lithification. So when they become sandstones, they become much less porous and go down to like 15% porosity and clays do the same, but even more drastically. Clays can start over 50% porosity as they're deposited. And then as they become compacted and when they become clay stones or shales, they go down to less than 10% porosity on average. And this porosity, this final value of porosity of clay stones and shales is a function of burial depth, how deep they were buried upon lithification. If they were buried really deep, their porosity will be lower. If they weren't buried very deep or they had early cementation between their grains, which typically doesn't happen for clays, but maybe for sandstones, if there was early precipitation of cements in their pore spaces, then porosity won't go as low as it would would have. But again, permeability does not equal porosity. If porosity goes up, yeah, typically permeability also goes up, but the things that control permeability are a bit different. For example, permeability is affected by grain size, unlike porosity, as well as grain shape, sorting, and packing. If the grains are large and loosely packed, they typically have greater permeability as shown in the bottom figure. If they're small and closely packed, on the other hand, they typically have lower permeability as shown on the right. And permeability is greater parallel to bedding rather than perpendicular to it, which probably makes sense because typically as we talked about throughout this whole video, grains tend to align themselves parallel to bedding, allowing pore spaces to be interconnected between those parallel grain boundaries and then permeability to happen through those interconnected pore spaces rather than perpendicular to it. And the last thing I want to just mention is that porosity and permeability are super important for both the storage and the passage of fluids and therefore super important for oil and gas and the storage of oil and gas and our extraction of that oil and gas. 
And because precipitation of cements can occur in pore spaces, porosity and permeability can sometimes become greatly reduced during burial and lithification or diagenesis. However, some sedimentary rocks can undergo changes during diagenesis that increase their porosity. For example, leaching or dissolution of carbonate cement. And we'll talk about all of this diagenetic precipitation, cement precipitation, fabrics of cements, as well as direct primary precipitation of chemical rocks in the next video when we talk about chemical fabrics. But for more on actual precipitation processes of calcite or any other mineral you'd like to know how it precipitates or how it might be biologically mediated in its precipitation, you can check out any one of my biomineralization videos. I actually have five of them, which is overkill, but I do. And you can check those out because a lot of the minerals that we're going to be talking about in the next video in terms of their fabrics had help when precipitating by biology. So that is all I have for today's video. If you want to check out the references I'm using to make this video, as well as all the videos in this set shot playlist, I'm using Sedimentology and Stratigraphy by Sam Boggs, as well as Sedimentary Rocks by Petty John. And these are both linked in my description below, as well as other minor and supporting references. And if you want to check out any of the other videos that we'll be talking about in this set shot playlist, or that were already talked about, such as those above the white arrows here, you can check out my channel or just click the card down below the little rectangle there that says said strap playlist and you can click that to watch all the other videos in this playlist thank you so much for watching and i will see you guys next time bye